before we begin, how frequently do people make jokes about there being a Nathan Badman? <laughs> Not that often. I've heard it before for sure, but it's been a while actually. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. We can start it off with that. I'm here with um, Nathan Goodman, professional econ smarty pants. Nathan, would you like to say hello? Hello, it's great to be here. Cool, great. Um, yeah, so I um, I could talk to you about a lot of things, but um, I specifically wanted to talk to you about um, public choice theory and how it intersects. Well, no, how it very easily lets you articulate a theory of class that, like despite public choice being like you know formalized decades ago uh has really only been like made explicit uh within the past like five years um so could you you could be could you just begin by like explaining to the audience what public choice theory is yeah absolutely so public choice theory emerged uh in the i think either 1950s 1960s uh, type era um, around a group of economists and political scientists who were coming together initially as the Committee on Non-Market Decision-Making, hmm. and eventually they changed their name to the Public Choice Society. And the basic idea of public choice at this time was we're going to use the tools of economics, the typical tools that economists were using to study markets, so we're going to focus on individuals and the incentives and constraints they face and how they respond to those incentives and constraints. And usually economists have used those tools to study markets. We're going to use them to study non-market settings, especially governments. Mm -hmm. So we'll look not just at the incentives that someone faces when they're going to the supermarket and deciding what food to buy. We'll look at how that same type of individual will uh, face incentives when they're going into the voting booth and deciding which politician to vote for, or the incentives facing a politician when they're deciding how to vote on a bill. Mm. And so it's taking this core economic way of thinking, this microeconomics theory framework of sort of methodological individualism, which is starting from an individual who acts, who has a set of goals that they would like to achieve, um, and who responds to incentives, costs and benefits, and applying that to a particular institutional context that isn't a conventional mm. market setting. So we're taking the same type of players, and this is what public choice theorists call behavioral symmetry. Mm. We're looking at a variation in the rules. So rather than it being the ordinary rules of market interaction, it's the rules that govern politics. So say a set of constitutional rules, a set of voting rules and so on. Mm. Um, and we're seeing what types of patterns of outcomes we would expect. And part of what this was pushing back on was kind of a asymmetry in the way economists had been talking about markets compared to how they'd been talking about government. Mm. So there was already a well-developed set of theories surrounding market failure. So you had this theory around sort of competitive, uh, a sort of perfectly competitive equilibrium that could be reached in a market. And then we identified deviations from that. So real world markets have externalities mm. and Im information asymmetries and, um, you know, collective action problems and public goods problems. Th these sorts of things that would that we would expect to lead to deviations from the kind of nice results of a perfectly competitive model, the people reaching a Pareto optimal solution mm. where um, everyone's been made better off. And now you reach this equilibrium where no one can be made better off without someone being made worse off. Uh, these, these sorts of welfare results and real world markets deviate from those. These are called market failures. And the way economists had typically talked about that was to say, all right, so that means there's room for a government to improve things through mm. some intervention. So you've got an externality problem. We'll figure out what the size of the difference between the um, between the private benefits of your action and the social 
uh, costs or benefits of your action and will either tax or subsidize you. This is often called a Pigouvian tax mm. in order to move you to the socially optimal result. Okay, so that's fine as a blackboard theory. But what the public choice theorists were pointing out is, all right, we could posit a hypothetical government that does that, but actual governments aren't some blackboard model or some benevolent mm. despot. Actual governments involve interactions between people, mm. just like markets do. And so we should study the institutions and incentives that occur within governments. And this could allow us to devise a theory, just like we have a theory of market failure, we could mm. have a theory of government failure. So mm. are there going to be political externalities from people interacting in the political process? Are there going to be information asymmetries among participants in the political process and so on? And so this is sort of applying the same tools that we've been applying to markets to governments and other non-market social settings. Mm. And that way we can have a richer understanding of the world. And instead of positing what Mike Munger calls unicorn governance, <laughs> where you've got some kind of magical solution that's idealized, that's going to solve all our problems. You ask, what can we realistically achieve given the given mm. real people mm. engaging in the political process? Yep. Okay. That's a very good explanation. Thank you very much. I think for like my listeners, like savvy enough that, you know, uh, is suggesting that the government might not be uh, filled with perfect angels who, you know, are optimal Bayesian rationalists or whatever. Uh, I think they might be like, well, duh. Um, but I think it's, I think it's, I think it's worth like contrasting this also with, um, uh, my hazy understanding of, say, the Marxist theory of the state, um, which is like basically that the um, that like the state is you know this uh, this institution that like you know is the just the way by which you know capitalists collectively manage society, um, and I. Uh, uh, so, so Michael Heinrich, uh, who's a Marxist, who recently uh, he did like a introduction to the first like Capital, basically that's um, introduction slash summary to Capital. It's like pretty good. Um, like I, one of the things I remember him talking about in that book is like how you know the the state is this institution that like uh, you know, and he gets this from uh not even like capital but like marx's um more journalistic writings um where he talks about how um like the state basically acts as a way to like it's got a longer time horizon than capitalists basically and capitalists basically use it to like check the um <clears throat> uh like you know self-destructive tendencies of the market uh, by like you know stopping actions that like you know were like are immediately beneficial but like would long term cause instability and uh, you know when I read that I was like but I can you know think of so many examples where like if that was true you know like uh that like y like you 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 can't explain I don't know like uh like energy policy or like the education system or like a bunch of other things uh by that logic uh and i think i think the public choice theory yeah. uh i think the public choice perspective is like considerably better um at explaining like what what the state is actually doing and how how, how capitalists basically retain power uh well not retain power but how how capitalists have so much influence over the state but also like the ways in which they don't um so i i, I know that's like a lot but can you kind of go off what i just said <laughs> yeah for sure so i definitely think there are some public choice economists who have noted affinities already between mm. uh Marxist and public choice analyses of the state. Mm. So for example, in a 2003 paper called Politics Without Romance, which is sort of just an overview of public choice, Bu James M. Buchanan, who won the Nobel Prize in economics and was one of the sort of founding figures of public choice, says, 
quote, in some of their implicit modeling of political behavior aimed at furthering special group or class interests, the Marxists seem to be closet associates of public choice, <laughs> even as they rejected methodological individualism. But how was the basic Marxist critique of politics, as observed, to be transformed into the idealized politics of the benevolent and omniscient superstate? This question was simply left glaringly unanswered. And so we see this. Uh, yeah. it, and there, of course, Buchanan actually sounds a lot like Bakunin yeah, um, yeah, yeah, in so far yeah. as like he's saying, yeah, Marx, I agree with you. The capitalists are using the state, mm. uh, but yep. those same incentive problems are going to exist with whichever vanguard you mm. put in charge of your new state. And yep. you can't just wave your hands and say, we've changed the class character. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's so it's going to be different. The, the class, so I think this kind of gets into this notion mm. of building a public choice foundation for class analysis mm. is the class conditions are not like some just material fact of who the people are or just a specific aspect of like some material relation to the mode of production. Mm. It's also a matter of the incentives for acting individuals to coalesce mm. in a way that creates a set of class relations and so mm -hmm. I think that's what some of the work that we're going to talk about by Randall Holcomb really provides us with yep. is kind of, so some macroeconomists like to talk about micro foundations for macroeconomics. Mm. Similarly, I think what Holcomb has given us is micro foundations for class analysis, mm. right? Yes. So instead yes. of just asserting that there are classes and yep. that people are identifiably within particular classes and as an entire class, they have this interest. And if you put people from the other class in charge, then suddenly you've changed yeah. the whole game. Instead, you're looking at how individuals respond to incentives and that how that generates yeah. an emergent outcome yes, of yes, class interests. Yes, yes. Okay. That is a hell of a thing to go on. Um, so now, uh, what is political capitalism, Nathan? Yeah, so... Holcomb gets the term political capitalism actually from a Marxist historian that many yeah. uh, listeners to this show may already be familiar with, namely Gabriel Kolko. Mm. And the basic idea of political capitalism, well, actually he gets it from Max Weber, but <laughs> also to some extent from Kolko. Um, but essentially the idea is that we've got this uh, mutually beneficial arrangement or uh, relationship between... Mm. Uh, business elites, economic elites, the sort of ruling class economically, and those who are in positions of political power. Mm. So when you, so he quotes uh, Kolko and as saying, progressivism was initially a movement for the political rationalization of business and industrial conditions, a movement that operated on the assumption that the general welfare of the community could be best served by satisfying the concrete needs of business. But the regulation itself was invariably controlled by leaders of the regulated industry and directed towards ends they deemed acceptable or desirable. It is business control over politics, and by business I mean the major economic interests, rather than political regulation of the economy that is the significant phenomenon of the progressive era. Mm. And then Holcomb says, this is what Kolko calls political capitalism. So the basic idea is it's the state acting in the interests of capitalists and there being this sort of exchange relationship this mutually beneficial crony relationship between business elites and uh political elites mm. um so that that's that i think is the core of it yep i think to like further get into why this is different from the marxist uh perspective i think you know we gotta we gotta do our methodological individualism and that means i think talking about transaction costs which i think is like it's it's surprisingly simple, uh, like the concept, but it, its consequences are quite profound. So, can you can you explain? You know, like the like let let's just like knock off like the most naive objection to like why this can't happen, which is like, well, yeah, but you know, there's like so many more poor people who you know are of like in a bunch of ways, uh, you know, how their lives are harmed by this arrangement and we you know we have a democratic process right so why can't you know they just like vote in people who will make things not like this yeah so that's a good question and i think there are a few reasons and um the core of how 
Holcomb explains this relates to transaction costs, but I, which I'm going to get into mm. in a moment. But the first thing I want to say is that there's a bunch of frictions that exist within democratic yeah. politics, and we could call these a type of transaction costs. So say you're um, voting for a politician. Um, well, you're voting for the politician, presumably because you want that politician to do certain things in your interest. So you're a poor person and you vote for, I don't know, Bernie Sanders or mm. Joe Biden or Donald Trump or whoever and say, I want this person because I think this person is going to represent me, unlike all those other elites or whatever. Mm. Right. And so you voted for them. All right. Now that you voted for them, that politician has to make decisions day to day. Mm. And there might be a benefit down the line in terms of getting your vote again if they do the things you want. But there's also a benefit in terms of getting additional campaign contributions, in terms of getting flown out to uh, conferences, in terms of getting to use the expertise and uh, the understanding of the issues that's presented by lobbyists or by testifying experts that comes from responding to interest groups that are more engaged in the day-to-day -day mm. interactions on within the legislative process, right? So let's say that you're a poor person who would rather your money be spent on, or, or who'd rather tax dollars be spent on healthcare than on building an F-35 fighter jet, Yep. right? Okay, that, that's understandable. That's reasonable. I agree. Um, <laughs> I, I also don't like building F-35 fighter jets. Um, uh, now... Say someone is serving on the Defense Appropriations Committee. They're going to not probably not have you coming into their office, but they're definitely going to get a lot of visits from like Lockheed Martin mm. lobbyists. And those Lockheed Martin lobbyists are going to show up at um, uh, they're going to show up to testify. They're going to show up to provide information. Uh, they're potentially going to be donors to campaigns. Uh, and in all likelihood, you're also going to need to hire staff. And mm. those staff are potentially going to be people who have experience working for the same lobbying firms as the Lockheed Martin lobbyists, right? Because you're going to want to hire people who have experience understanding things about the legislative process. Mm. Well, that's a set of specialized skills. Where are you going to, where else are you going to lucratively use those skills? Well, at a lobbying mm. firm. And so what we get is a set of specialized professionals mm. that have a lot of social relationships with people who have more entrenched interests related to this stuff. And so they have a lot of social ties. They know who to call. Mm. They know who to contact. And it's in their interest to know these things. Mm. Whereas the costs of acquiring that information about who to contact even are a lot higher for somebody who has not specialized in mm influencing public policy in this way so you and i are outside of that low transaction cost group so now that i've said low transaction yeah, cost yeah. group i should explain what are transaction costs because we've been alluding to this term but i haven't yep. defined yeah, it yeah no, no no so the idea of transaction costs comes from the work of ronald coase mm. so ronald coase is another nobel laureate in economics mm. and he had several groundbreaking articles that really fleshed out this concept one is uh, the problem of social cost and so this is kind of a response to the um, externalities literature, an engagement with the notion of externalities. And so you say you've got some externality problems, say that I live next door to you and you are a dentist mm. and I am a candy maker. And my mortar and pestle for making candy is very loud and makes it hard for you to do dent to practice dentistry. Well, there, there's an externality there, but it's sort of a bilateral externality in some sense, right? Suppose I was operating the mortar and pestle and then you moved in to practice dentistry. Uh, what hadn't been an externality before has now become an externality. There's now a conflict between the two of us. Mm. Now, what Coase points out is in a, zero, in a world where there's no costs but for the two of us bargaining with one another, mm. um, whichever one of us has a higher willingness to pay for the use of that space could say to the other one, I'm going to pay you $80 to fuck off or whatever, right? <laughs> like, yeah. like like that meme, right? So so we, we, we could pay the other one to enough that they would be better off mm. ceasing their activities or moving their activities elsewhere. 
um, and that we'd be better off because now we can do our thing in peace. Mm. Um, now, the problem is that for a lot of real world externalities, the costs are too high for that type of negotiation to take place. Mm. Right. So um, think about air pollution. I am not going to go up to every driver and be like, hey, you're polluting my air and I am willing to pay you five dollars to drive less or something. Right. Like that's it would be costly to even find all these people. Mm. Right. It, the cost would exceed the cost. I fa- the cost of discovering who to even make deals with would exceed the benefit to me of making those deals. Mm. Uh, and so transaction costs me. And so the conclusion coast draws from this is that when there are significant transaction costs, it actually matters who you assign the initial rights to, because if, if there were zero transaction costs, people would just, whatever, whoever you assigned the initial right to do the, to, mm. to have control over the overall property rights, like saying you have the right to uh, run your mortar and pestle. And if people want you to stop, they can talk with you about it or pay you to stop. Um, or saying you have the right to practice dentistry in peace. There's a noise ordinance. People can pay you to um, choose not to ask for it to be enforced. Mm. Um, in a zero transaction cost world, we would negotiate to the efficient result. We're mm. not in a zero transaction cost world. So the assignment of rights and the particular rules matters. Uh, Coase also develops this concept in another seminal article called The Nature of the Firm, mm. where he basically says that the reason firms exist is that um, so at first he's like, wait a minute, these are sort of islands of c- yep. central planning. Yep. But I thought Hayek said and Mises said that it's more efficient to coordinate things through prices. So what gives? Why do we have these islands of central planning? And he's like, okay, well, the reason is that there are costs associated with using the market. You need to like find people to negotiate with for all these spot transactions. Yep. So instead of doing spot transactions, it would sometimes pay to put this into a single organization where you don't need to negotiate prices with people to do things. You can just tell people, Hey, do this for me or whatever. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's another response to transaction costs. And the same thing is going to be true for politics, right? So um, within politics, you could say, well, in theory, in a zero transaction cost world, I could, there would be no cost to searching out, searching for information about what government officials have done there would be no cost to negotiating with them. And we could just like have a set of negotiations that goes on. And then we reach the sort of Mm. decision that maximizes value for everybody. But in practice, of course, that's not what happens in practice. Some people can easily negotiate with politicians and others can't. Mm. And the people who face low costs of negotiating with politicians are in the low transaction cost group. And that's what Holcomb would call the elites or the ruling class. Mm. Right. Um, so the, the people who can engage in these mutually beneficial deals that then impose externalities on people who face too high of transaction costs to um, try to negotiate for better conditions, um, the, 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 rest, the rest of us who face those high transaction costs have to bear the costs of the mm. negotiations between, say, like Goldman Sachs and Lockheed Martin and like Joe Manchin and Joe yep. Biden and uh, so on, right? Mm. Yep. Yep. Good, good explanation. Um, Thanks. Yeah. So one thing that you didn't mention that Holcomb mentions is um, what this, uh, there's mutually beneficial arrangements, but also there's also like the ability to put pressure um, from both sides uh, to make the other side do what mm-hmm. they want. Uh, so in his book, Holcomb talks about how, you know, once you have say, so once a politician like passes uh, a law or a policy favoring like a particular interest group, uh, they can then be like, they can, they can then go to that interest group and be like, I will take this away if you don't do what I do. No, if you don't do what I want. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I found that really interesting because um, it, it coincides with, um, you know, another work that, you know, is arguably anarchist class theory that does not speak its name namely um james c scott seeing like a state wherein Mm -hmm. scott you know is you know big one big idea is um you know the notion of legibility and how like you know uh states acting is it's not like you know universally uh competent in all domains it actually favors a very particular environment um of you know things being made easy for it to ma- manipulate and like that example of 
you know, uh, politicians being able to be like, okay, like if you don't do what I want, like I'm going to remove this thing that's protecting you. Um, you know, it, it, it made me think back to uh, Scott's book because like there's this um, equilibrium where like, um, you know, even if both entities like would prefer to get away from this particular point, uh, the nature of uh, the way things work means that like they are encouraged to move towards it. Um, even if, mm-hmm. you know, th- they would be like, yeah, like, you know, I don't know, maybe like I would like a more uh, like fluid and open process. Uh, the fact that like, you know, things need to be set up a certain way such that, um like policies can actually have an impact means that like it doesn't like uh it it it's like it, it it's not like you know people are powerless against this but like it is it's not like you know a flat plane um it's like a slope and like it requires it requires like constant energy to not be like pushed down the slope basically right yeah no, that's a really good point. And I think I, I hadn't thought about the connection between those, uh, what Holcomb would draw on Fred McChesney call rent extraction arrangements and uh, Scott's work on legibility. But I think that makes a lot of sense. But yeah, mm. so Holcomb there is drawing on the work of a law and economics scholar named Fred McChesney, who had sort of been building on the previously existing literature and public choice on rent seeking. So the idea of rent seeking is you're going to invest resources as say a private firm to Mm. get special privileges from the government. So you're going to say, all right, I would like a monopoly or I would like to keep a monopoly. So I'm going to spend a bunch of money or uh, spend a bunch of resources lobbying for that special privilege. Mm. But what McChesney points out is, yeah, you can, that happens, but it's very hard observationally to distinguish sometimes between that and a situation where a politician say would call up a company that's been receiving special privileges and say, nice subsidy you got there (laughs) would be a shame if anything were to, happen to it and then the next day the <laughs> firm donates a uh, yeah. substantial sum to the politician's campaign and comes out with a, a press release about how they're shaping up in some important way and you know the next week we have the metaverse announcement from facebook or something not that i'm accusing this making a specific yeah. claim about whether anything facebook has done as a result of rent extraction or rent seeking but um, i mean you know. i mean the great the great thing about like you know uh the state of the economy today is like you can point to pretty much any fortune like 500 company and be like they're probably doing rent rent seeking and like you know you'll just be proven right um so yeah yeah. absolutely yeah but no um i think this is important because i think it a good way to think about like why all of this is important it not just you know intellectual curiosity although like you know it it is like just fascinating alone uh but um but also because like i think that you know any um like any attempt to describe how you know the obvious naive fact that like why don't the masses rise up against like the tiny minority i think like any attempt to explain like why this isn't the case like unless 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 your answer is like well you know the ruling class is just like naturally better than us i think any attempt to explain it uh inevitably like gives you something of a blueprint for how to overcome it um and yeah the um like the 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 public choice perspective is like one thing that like just really hit me was just how uh like it wasn't just you know condemning uh actually existing capitalism but also like leftist attempts to overcome it for like you know uh mm. the last like century and a bit um and like how 
you know, uh, again, going back to your point about, you know, uh, oh, what's what's his name? Oh, James Cole Buchanan. Cole? No, Buchanan referencing yep. Bakunin. Ha <laughs> ha. Alliteration. <laughs> um, but like, you know, how how like uh, fundamentally like leftists like kind of didn't really get the nature of the beast that they were trying to destroy. And so, you know, mm-hmm. they, they set up these, and, and I'm not just, you know, talking about like the most egregious examples of like, uh, you know, state socialism, but also like more like fluffier, uh, social democracies and also like, you know, like even labor unions, um, and, and more just like you know the general assumption about um like how it might seem like wild to people today but like you know in like the early decades of the um of the 20th century like you know marxists were like really optimistic um about like capitalist technological progress like eventually leading the way to socialism um and, and like they they like yeah, it's it's like kind of crazy uh like you know there were people who were like really committed um and like there's like there's like a reason that so many people will like be like oh yeah like this this is like a religion <laughs> um and you know you've got like you've got books like you know communism the god that failed which um you know is a collection of a bunch of writings of like former marxists who were like got really disillusioned after the soviet union um and you know it like revelations about what was actually going on um but like the um like the the the, i i think and and we're probably gonna have to like unpack this in stages but i think like the public choice perspective like really explains like both like why these like various attempts like kind of failed but also like I think, or I think also like why, um, uh, and this, it's sort of been like a, like, like what, one other thing that has happened, uh, the, one other thing that Marxists have done in response to all this is like, to not just be like, oh, you know, like everything's fucked, we're, like everything's horrible forever, but also to start being like, capitalism is stagnating. Um, and I, I think, I think there is like, that's, you know, technological progress is like, and, and scientific progress is like very complicated, but I think there are, um, I think there are certainly like valid arguments to make about, there certainly are valid arguments one could make that like, we have seen some stagnation in some areas that, that is concerning. Um, and anyway, all, all this to say is I think, I think actually, I think the public choice perspective uh, does a much better job at, at explaining both like why these attempts failed and also like the tra- the trajectory of capitalism um since uh, and also finally um how we might like how we should think about going about resisting it like effectively um so i know that's a lot <laughs> would you like to comment <laughs> Oh, for sure. So I think that in terms of the understanding of what went wrong with uh, various experiments with state socialism, especially the Soviet Union, Mm -hmm. one scholar who has done an extensive amount to analyze that using insights from both public choice economics, Mm -hmm. as well as um, Austrian market process theory and Mm -hmm. uh, new institutional economics is Peter Betke. And he has a book called Calculation and Coordination, which is on um, a lot of the it's it's a lot of his earlier work on the Soviet Union. And in particular, there's a paper that became a chapter in that called um, uh, I'm going to search rent seeking and socialist and see whether you can. Uh, yep. pull it up uh yeah yeah so soviet venality a rent-seeking model mm. of the communist state which huh. he co-authored with a guy named anderson and basically he just like we've been talking about how holcomb analyzes contemporary uh sort of political capitalism as a rent-seeking society similarly anderson and betke analyze how the soviet union in practice was a rent-seeking 
um, society. Mm. And so instead of treating um, communist rulers as though they're sort of single-mindedly trying to maximize the public interest, Mm. they provide a public choice model of the Soviet state and argue Mm. that it's very similar to the mercantilist economies of 16th and 17th century Mm. Europe. And so it's not sort of just we've got these idealistic Marxists who are Mm. trying to implement uh, socialism and uh, this, this is just the result of them trying to implement it all in good faith, but instead each leader within the hierarchy responds to incentives and we're going to see rent seeking by the mm. people operating in various sectors of the uh, Soviet economy. Yep. And so, uh, so I think that that provides a really useful analytical mm. jumping off point. And I think if you combine it with um, Munger and Villarreal Diaz's um, the road to crony capitalism, which mm. is a relatively recent paper in, the independent review that argues that there's a tendency for any capitalist economy with a democratic state to tend towards cronyism because mm. the um, you, you get diminishing marginal benefits to each kind of investment mm. um, as you invest more in it. As you've invested more and more in sort of productive uh, investments, say like technological innovation, Mm. Uh, that's going to decline. There's going to be diminishing marginal returns to that. And eventually the marginal benefit of investing in some rent seeking is going to Mm. exceed the marginal benefit of investing in more productive activity, um, more socially productive activity. And so the marginal benefit to you of investing in rent seeking is higher. And so eventually, even if you start from like, say some like idealized liberal state, that's going Mm. to, you're eventually going to head down the road to crony capitalism. Yep. Um, so that's, that's one analysis of that within sort of capitalist state settings. Mm. And we see similar things from Betke and Anderson in an attempt at a socialist state. Yep. Um, we also see um, very useful for analyzing the potential um, stagnation uh, point in Mansur Olson's book, The Rise and Decline of Nations, yep. in which he argues that we're going to see all of these interest groups forming and getting into entrenched positions. And that's going to lead to a bunch of rules that slow down production, all these, all this different regulatory graft, and that this is going to lead to stagnation and decline until some shock Mm. uh, dislodges those coalitions. And so his argument there is that, for example, the economic revival that we saw in Mm. uh, Japan was in, at least in part, a result of Japan getting utterly, uh, wrecked in world war ii right like getting literally Mm. nuked and having to restructure a lot of things in response to as as part of their conditions of surrender that dislodged the old sort of what he would call distributional coalitions i think Mm. um yep and that there are similar things to that and to be clear that's not an endorsement of (laughs) nuking japan i think that was wrong and mass murder that's that's an analysis of some of the consequences of that Mm. um but I think, I think that sort of analysis tells us something about these tendencies for any sort of hierarchical social yep. system yep. Uh, where you've got a state to give rise to these interest group coalitions and this buildup of a set of rent-seeking interests. So the, the other thing I will say in terms of providing us with a sort of blueprint for how we resist, mm. um, one way public choice can help for that is that public choice doesn't just mean analyzing decision-making within formal politics. It's more Mm. generally analysis of non-market decision-making. So some public choice theorists have analyzed social movements more generally. So Mm. for example, um, Dennis Chong has a book called Collective Action and the Civil Rights Movement, where he looks at the incentives within civil rights movements. Uh, Michaela Novak has a recent book out on social movements and liberal political economy, where she applies public choice as well as other um, uh, theoretical lenses that are sort of analytically similar to um, analyze social movements. And so that provides us with one analysis of a mode of resistance is uh, how do people engage in collective action together, mm. building up social movements. And so this is sort of a literature that's less the sort of um, part of public choice that's analyzing the state and arguably more akin to like some of Eleanor Ostrom's work, mm. which analyzes yep. how do people engage in non-market decision-making where they're building bottom-up self-governing arrangements. Yep. Um, 
And then the other thing that I think is worth pointing to is what some of the literature on what we might call evasive entrepreneurship, yep. as well yep. as what Abigail Devereaux has called piecemeal circumnavigation of the administrative state. Yep. Um, so this idea of people can directly flaunt existing rules, right? Or flout mm. existing rules, violate them. Um, and sometimes that's not going to be enforced. And so you can you can act, you can engage in what David Graeber would call defiant insistence on acting as if one is already free. Yep. You might not apply it to some of the same things that these theorists would. Mm -hmm. um, but you can then render some of the existing rules that enforce a set of special privileges unenforceable. Mm -hmm. And the benefit that that's going to have is if you were instead trying to engage in lobbying to beat mm -hmm. these entrenched interest groups in the political arena, one, yep. the fact that they have the privileges means that they're in the um, low transaction cost group already. And two, what um, Gordon Tullock called the transitional gains trap mm. means that they've already sunk a bunch of resources into um, getting these, into securing and maintaining these privileges and that it's already sort of been priced in. So say you bought a taxi medallion, you're not necessarily making like super high profits because the price of the taxi medallion already sort of priced in the monopoly privilege you were going to have. Um, but that means that you're going to make losses if suddenly there's a bunch more taxis, like say Uber moves into the area, right? And so you have a strong incentive to lobby to keep those privileges because you're out a bunch of money otherwise. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And if Uber had, instead of like rolling out an app that um, allowed you to do ride sharing in defiance of the medallion system, instead mm -hmm. said, I'm going to hire a bunch of lawyers and lobbyists to try yeah. and... Uh, get a new set of laws that allows us to tr move beyond this system, chances are they would have lost that fight. Yep. But because instead they just, without asking permission, rolled out this product. And to be clear, I'm not saying that there can't be important critiques of that yeah, product yeah, yeah, or, yeah, 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 yeah. or anything yep. else. Yep. But yep. it successfully routed around this transitional gains trap by just Put, introducing competition into this market where had, it had previously been precluded due to these special privileges that had strong political incentives yep. for maintaining them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one one way that I would describe it is um, in terms of like the terrain you're fighting on. And I think that trying to go through like the electoral route is it's like fighting in terrain that's very slanted to already existing um, interests. And... And this yes. is, and I think, I think, I think a big part of this is again, going back to like James C. Scott stuff is um, like, you know, the, the state again is like, it's not this, like in terms of capabilities, it is not like this neutral actor. Like there are some domains it's like really effective in and other domains it like flounders. And so the fact that class privileges are maintained using this, uh, well, not entirely maintained by, but a significant chunk is maintained through this institution. Like that means that, like, you 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 know, it's it's like basically like it's a it's an asymmetric conflict. Like, you know, it's yes. not like it's not like chess. It's like I don't know, more like Starcraft or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's right, and I also think that both. Uh, Marxists and social democrats to some mm. extent will take a view that something like this the only way to stop a bad class is a state with a state is a good class yeah. with a state right yep. um, but in practice states have a bunch of internal dynamics and incentive effects that will drive yep. towards there being a relatively small class what Holcomb calls the low transaction cost group mm externalizing a bunch of costs onto everybody else, mm. making deals amongst themselves and occasionally engaging in various conflict amongst themselves yep. and uh, largely engaging opportunistically in ways that exploit and harm those who are outside the low transaction cost group. And that's true, whether it's a, yeah. regardless of the ideological makeup of who's inside that low transaction cost group. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and and also like, um, yeah, yeah, it's it's just it's just a very neat and elegant theory, um, which you know, agrees. Just, just it, it's like yeah, it's just very very like beautiful and like yeah, I, that 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 sort of thing is like why just you know go a little meta for a second. 
this sort of thing is like why I'm confident that like, you know, in the like next decade or so, I think that like, uh, like anarchist um, political economy can like really uh, not like, you know, it, it, like I don't think, you know, we're going to get like everyone to our side, but I think like mm-hmm. we're going to seriously dislodge Marxism as like the default assumption mm-hmm. for like, if you're an anti-capitalist, like you're either like a Marxist or you're like, you're some other weird thing. <laughs> yeah. I don't have a good enough gauge on what's going on within various yeah, yeah. movements to be yes, confident yes. about that, but I certainly hope you're right. Yeah. And I do think that there's good reasons to think you're right, both in terms of the fact that I think anarchists as a matter of their type of praxis mm. are pushing for things that can get you a lot more concrete gains in real time, right? Yeah. Like suppose you're building up a party and then like, like I feel like a lot of Marxist praxis is a, an attempt at base building and building up a specific hierarchical party. Yep. That party eventually splits because it's high value <laughs> real estate and yep. different factions yep. Yep. will emerge trying to uh, make it useful. And so suddenly you've got two organizations calling themselves the freedom road socialist organization <laughs> Not to pick on them specifically, but yeah. I think it's funny that there are two with literally that name now because of their split a while back. Yeah. Um, uh, and whereas, and, and they're not anywhere closer to having built a revolutionary vanguard that is going to overthrow capitalist <laughs> imperialism, right? Whereas yeah. at least no matter how grim the prospects for anarchy as some macro scale yeah. Uh, social arrangements seem at the very least if you've been involved in food not bombs for a while you've fed a bunch of people yeah. and if you've been involved in the anarchist black cross for a while you've at least built relationships with people in prison and made their lives under like the one of the most repressive aspects of the state marginally less terrible because mm. you've built those relationships and maintained a movement for prisoner solidarity on the outside right mm. and so I think in part the fact that anarchist politics focuses on this prefigurative politics aspect mm. that um, has sort of, one thing that I sometimes think about when I think about political and social strategy is sort of what's the consolation prize. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And the consolation prize with like an election is yeah. kind of nil. It's like, yeah, yeah. either you get 50% plus one or, yeah. well, thanks for the memories, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And similarly, I feel like a lot of, Marxist politics is like that, right? Like it's all building up towards we are going to have the vanguard that is going to seize control of the state. And that's it. Whereas anarchist politics is a lot more about we're going to enact things that are more consistent with our values in the here Mm. and now. And if that leads to a stateless, classless society down the road, that's that's the big goal. But in the meantime, we can act in ways that are consistent with our values and help people out. And I'm not saying that people of other tendencies don't do stuff like that. Like yeah. the Black Panther Party was formerly a Marxist Leninist organization and they also did the like yeah, free yeah, breakfast yeah, yeah, program yeah. and stuff. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. it's not as though anarchists have a monopoly on these types of tactics, but I do think these types of tactics build up more gains on the margin without yeah. you having to sort of achieve this kind of eschatological goal of we will we will see the end of capitalism to see some gains. Yeah, the, like the way I would put it is like, I think that like anarchists, like at least the good ones, like there, there's like a discrete range of outcomes, whereas Marxists, it's far mm-hmm. more binary. And yes, and, and also, and also I think that anarchists have like a much more, a much better appreciation for like the range of possible um like uh state so like it, it, it's like more multi-dimensional like the possible yes. like states the future could be in uh, and, and again like marxist it's like very it's much like much lower dimensional um and and like i think i think going and again like just fucking gonna keep on going back to it but james c scott um like you know one way if you're gonna like you know, mathematically formalize like his arguments and seeing like a state, like one way to do it would be like to say that the state um, operates in uh, it, it's best at operating in like a very like low dimensional, uh, like linear environment where like, you know, it's simple cause and effect. Um, and, you know, that 
like that that that's important not just because like you know i would like personally <laughs> personally like to live in like a world that was uh significantly like more multidimensional and less linear um but also like you know that that has like like practical implications for um uh like fighting back against capitalism like if like capitalism as a system is certainly more adaptive and uh, as you know the left found out in the 20th century uh than prior forms of class um arrangements but like if you if you know where to look like you can find like really obvious examples of it like deliberately of like it deliberately restricting like possibilities um for the purposes of control and um like you know it's i i feel like it's in like those sort of like that like space that is like uh it's 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 ambiguous because there's like so much possibility there that like that that's like where the really interesting stuff is and like you can sort of twist like parts of marxism to like you know sort of talk about this usually involves a lot of like people saying stuff is dialectical but like (laughs) the language used is like really vague and to me it's like just so weighed down with like all this baggage that and like you can like because anarchism thankfully does not have like this adherence to you know like central texts or even like central figures it's just so much easier to like you know be like hey like uh this is like this is like a way of thinking about things um and like it's just it's just so much easier to communicate it because like you don't have all this baggage that's like you know causing i guess epistemic friction (laughs) yeah yeah it's it's interesting that sort of the the very feature of marxism that has made it conceptualize itself as scientific socialism (laughs) has made it in some sense less open to scientific revolutions (laughs) because they've defined themselves around a specific social scientific paradigm and said this is the social science that a revolutionary movement will use and then whenever there's any scientific critique of it they need to tack on epicycles or like maintain that paradigm whereas anarchism is more generally just like a social movement and a set of ethical claims about non-domination. Yeah. Um, and then we can use whichever social scientific framework we think is applicable to a problem. So a lot of anarchists rely on research from anthropology or archaeology. And then there's various anarchist political theorists and there's anarchists who are drawing on game theory. Yep. And, you know, you and I are drawing on, uh, public choice economics here and of course you've talked with other guests about the use of complexity theory for yep. understanding economics and i think uh, and for understanding anarchism which fits really well with the james scott stuff because even though i don't think he frames it in terms of complexity theory as you were saying mm. imposing legibility on a system means deliberately trying to make it simpler than it is and social systems as they evolve dynamically will tend towards a greater degree of complexity, which means that any imposed intervention is going to have a bunch of unintended consequences Mm. and is going to be both harder to monitor and harder to control. So Mm -hmm. I think complex system science, market process theory, anthropology, archaeology, political economy, including public choice, Bloomington school, uh, new institutional economics, transaction cost economics, all of these have a place for understanding the world. Mm. And we can have a more open-ended scientific conversation about that as anarchists than you can if you're a somebody who's committed yourself to being named after a particular theorist. And mm. obviously within left revolutionary movements, the most common version of that is I am a Marxist or I am a Marxist-Leninist or I am a Marxist-Leninist Maoist. But yep. of course on the libertarian right, you see this too with people mm. who are like, I am a Misesian and I am a strict Misesian, right? There are some people around the Mises Institute who I get the feeling they think that some of the people I've been referencing who are coming out of the Austrian school that use a lot of public choice aren't like true Austrians because they're corrupting it with other 
research from economics and it's like no let's have like an open <laughs> research program and yes. build up uh, yeah, 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 an understanding yeah. of the world let's let's try yes. to be lifelong learners <laughs> <laughs> yes let's let's like you know try to like have like basic scientific uh standards where you know we like interrogate ideas and if you know they don't t- stand up to scrutiny then we drop them um you know very very yeah. utopian but you know I- i'm feeling in a good mood today so <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna dream yeah let's keep these ideas as an invitation to inquiry rather than as a sacred text or a catechism or something yeah 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 so yeah you know what there's there's probably like a good public choice um analysis of like why uh like these sorts of um you can probably use transaction costs to explain like why there's like such a rigid uh focus on like a single you know set of texts um (laughs) and i'm not even joking i think um i think there's like something there yeah i think that's exactly right and i think there are a few different ways you Mm. can model it right so one way to model it if you're say around a think tank is if you want to say to it's it's much easier to get certain people to donate to you if you can say we are the only people keeping this intellectual tradition alive if you want to see these ideas survive for another generation you need to fund us right and so and i I do get the impression that mm. some people around, say, the Ludwig von Mises Institute put out a message yeah. of that sort in a way that gets them sort of like stodgy old donors. Yeah. And um, I, I don't want to like, mm. you know, smear anyone. So I, I, I'm not 100 percent sure if that's the case, but that's an impression I get is that they is that some of them see or put out a message of that sort as a way of getting support and getting their supporters to feel like they are the last bastion of support for freedom and sound economics. And there's probably, I think, similar things surrounding a, a Marxist parties of various sorts, right? Where they're like, we are the hope for the revolution. We are the ones who are pure Marxists. Everyone else are all the other leftists are rad libs who don't understand true scientific socialism. Yep. The revisionists. They're revisionists. Yeah, that sort of thing of like saying we're the pure ones uh, allows you to get certain supporters to say, oh, well, if I want these ideas to succeed, I need to donate to these people. Whereas if and so you're essentially sort of narrowly defining the kind of product you're selling. Right. So Mm -hmm. demand for any given product is more inelastic when there's fewer available substitutes, which means people are willing to pay a higher price for it. Well, if you, through a set of narratives, define certain things as not substitutes yep. for what you're selling, not necessarily in a market here, these are often non-market institutions, but either you're asking for donations or in the case of a Marxist party, you're asking for dues paying mm. members, right? People are going to pay higher dues to your Marxist party if they think this is the only Marxist party that is going to successfully bring about revolution. Whereas if you're like, well, I could shop around. I could say, am I going to go join the PSL or the CPUSA or the DSA, right? Whereas if instead you put forward something that says, we are the ones who have the scientific analysis that will bring about revolution. And yeah, we'll go to the same protests as those people, but they are all revisionists. Then if you have a bunch of people who believe that, they're not going to say, well, dues increase this year. You know, I think I'm going to go join the DSA. There's more people there anyway. Yeah. And and also like um but also like you know um there's like obvious um incentives towards like dogmatism um if like you just want everyone on the same page yes. cuz cuz you know like transaction costs also include like you know like a group deciding to do a thing and so if you can be like ah yes but it is you know if you'd yes. read like you know such and such figure you'd know that like this is obviously like genius strategic dialectical strategy uh and you know like that sort of intellectual conformity means it's just like easier to get people to do stuff uh i I think that's also a part of it (laughs) oh absolutely and that fits really well with one of the like classic texts of public choice which is buchanan and tullock's the Mm. calculus of consent where they model setting up collective decision rules as sort of a trade-off between Uh, political externalities and sort of costs of coming Mm. to a collective decision. So if you've got pure consensus, 
um, then you aren't going to have any ex negative externalities yep. on people because you're only going to make a decision if mm. everyone agrees. So it's only going to happen if it's beneficial to everybody in the group, but it's really costly to come to any decision. Whereas when you get closer and closer to like a smaller number of people being needed to mm. make a decision, then you're going to come to decisions more quickly and at lower cost mm. of negotiation, but it's more likely that there will be negative externalities on those who didn't endorse mm. that view. And so there's more room, say, with a majority rule view for you to get a situation where 51% um, of the people in the organization uh, um, dominate the rest of the people in the organization, or if you have like more of a vanguard that can autonomously make decisions where that vanguard dominates everyone in the organization and imposes negative externalities on them. And what you're pointing out in your points is that there are other ways to lower collective mm. decision costs, such as creating a set of like ideological shortcuts for browbeating mm. people yeah. into agreement. Um, saying, you know, if, if you don't agree with X, you're a liberal is <laughs> like a sort of straightforward way to lower the collective decision-making costs. <laughs> uh, yep. So yeah, th this is what I was getting at when like I say that public choice theory is like a fractal theory of class. Cause like, you know, yes. like it, it has the virtue of both explaining like why, why capitalism is capitalism, but also like why we see these like micro uh class dominations in uh you know like people who are ostensibly trying to resist uh class domination <laughs> yes absolutely yeah ah oh, it's just i i just it's just so elegant and and beautiful um agreed i i don't know if i made this joke on twitter but um i i was thinking about how like i i'd like start investing in like therapy for like you know like boxes who are like actually intellectually curious uh for when like they find all this stuff out and they get really depressed because like you know it's like an obvious theory that both explains like like why things are bad but also like why they've had a bad experience like doing marxist stuff in marxist parties <laughs> <laughs> you know you know nancy mclean is an ex uh, Trotskyist, so I sometimes wonder oh, if really? democracy in chains is really just cope. She's like, you know, we, we think that it's, it's the, the, the charitable read of McLean is she's actually trying to explain the role that Buchanan and other uh, public choice theorists played in the specific coke network uh, elements yeah, yeah. of the right. But the the uncharitable read that I just thought of based on what you said is she's an ex Trotskyist who had bad experiences in the ISO, read some Buchanan, actually understood it, and was like, "My God, this explains why everything sucks." But yeah. how can this right wing asshole have better explained what's wrong with capitalism and the ISO than my preferred theorist? <laughs> Screw this guy. Yeah, no. yeah, 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 yeah. I, 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 I actually, I, I forgot about, I, about that. But M McLean, that is. Um, but like, yeah, I wanted to bring her up because, like, it is like peak irony. Like, it's the sort of thing you'd find in, like, I don't know, a Thomas Pynchon novel, wherein, like, you know. <laughs> these ostensibly branded as quote unquote neoliberal thinkers, uh, their theories actually do a better job of explaining like the state of the world today and also why like uh, we've had such a hard time moving beyond it uh, than the people who are ostensibly supposed to be doing that. And they get like branded uh, as like, you know, dangers to like everything we care about uh, and like, the worst possible people and then and then but then also like the people who are you know uh all about supposedly overcoming things they're like central like leading light is this guy who is like ah i'm gonna use what the bad people write and show how it actually shows like what the good pe like it actually shows that we should all be good it's <laughs> it's like layers of meta <laughs> and it's just very very it's like it's like the sort of thing where i'm like i wake up and i'm like am i in like a simulation like this all seems like way too stupid to like actually be real um so 
But once again, transaction costs explain it, right? Because yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, that's that's yes, yes. That is the part that like gets you the most. It's like, oh my god, the theory that everyone is like, you know, saying is bad, but no one actually reads. Like, actually does a pretty good job of explaining like this entire fucking situation. Oh, continue. Sorry. Yeah, because it, it's cost, it's costly to read this stuff, right? It yep. takes time. Yeah. And so, and it's also I, more pleasant to read people you anticipate agreeing with. Yeah. Than to read people that you think you need to like be suspiciously like thinking through every line to be like, okay, do I agree with that? Does that premise make sense? Are you trying to fool me? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and sorry. And also, like, if you know, you're a Marxist and you're like, hey, like, I've been reading like, you know, people you call neoliberals, like, you know, you'll oh, get, yeah. like, you'll get like yelled at. <laughs> it like, it's like, you know, socially costly to do this sort of thing. Absolutely. Yeah. It's the sort of thing where, you you have a group that is for you your low transaction cost group your social network and it's useful to maintain mm. those ties and reading and uh genuinely learning things from and treating as useful sources the sort of wrong people can get you to be perceived as an enemy and in part that's again people responding to their mm. own transaction costs right like it's costly to figure out who's trustworthy yeah. who's going to have your back in a particular time yep. and so we develop yep. various social signals to signal to other people i am trustworthy i am on your team i am a good person for you to interact with I will be a trustworthy yep. partner for future interactions. And so this can result yeah. in it becoming more socially costly under these conditions of uncertainty and imperfect information, both to figure out, well, is this person worth reading and taking seriously and interpreting charitably? Mm. And once you've done that, yep. it becomes costly for other people to interact with you from their perspective once you're yep. sending off signals that they see as correlated with being somebody on the other team. And so... Yep. In, in a world yep. of perfect information or a world where it was very low <laughs> cost to acquire information um, about whether somebody yeah. was acting opportunistically relative to you, I don't think these dynamics would develop. But in mm. the real world we live in where it's costly to acquire information and people can screw you over after sort of um, – uh, after a set of repeated interactions where you've invested something into it, I think people having these quick and dirty sort of partisan signals that they mm. interpret to try and figure out whether someone is trustworthy makes sense, especially if they're politically active. But the problem is it results in mm. there being these useful analytical tools that are left on the table because it's socially yep. costly to pick them up and apply them in these new contexts. Mm. And so... Yeah, so I think yep. once again the theory yeah. explains the uh, sort of the undesirable yep. outcome we find ourselves in vis-a-vis -vis the people who I would most like to see using the theory using it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Here's a question I just thought of. Then, do you think that do you think that this means that like it's so like obviously this means like it's very difficult to have like a social movement like actually practice like be like epistemically rigorous mm -hmm. uh so, so do you think do you think it's possible to like have a social movement that's like epistemically rigorous then uh and if so like what are the conditions to make that happen that's a really good question and i think that one thing that's likely to happen is people will be more epistemically rigorous where it's more to their benefit to do so than than in other settings right so mm. like when, when a movement is engaging in, say, power mapping, like trying to figure out who mm. is on their side, who's against their specific concrete current goal, um, those sorts of tasks that are more the like day-to-day -day things of figuring out how do we achieve this more, this goal where I'll have feedback on, did I successfully get them to defund the police or not or whatever, right? Like uh, mm. that's something where since you get quicker feedback on it and you're trying to figure it out mm. to achieve a concrete goal, there's more of an incentive to invest resources in learning the stuff. Whereas when it's some sort mm. of like more high level thing of like, which overarching political theory should I use? I think it's going to be very costly mm. to get people to engage seriously with the arguments of theoretical frameworks that are seen as outside the scope of the movement mm -hmm. and there one thing that can help is that, that some people are operating in different institutional environments where they face a different set of incentives right so maybe it's profitable mm -hmm. for an academic to do something that involves bridging these gaps because then you've found a novel gap in the literature 
which means you can get a publication mm. where maybe you couldn't before, right? And so um, mm. there might be room for sort of cross-pollination and spillovers from academia into other social movements um, to uh, mm. do this better. And so that could help. Um, there's also, I, th I think one thing to think about is every sort of failure um, whether that's a market mm. failure, a political failure, or whatever, represents in some sense an unrealized opportunity. And so mm. where movements are currently not intellectually rigorous, that means there's an opportunity for where there would be benefits to people from being mm. part of a more intellectually rigorous movement, them to uh, engage in something mm. to build that. And I mean, like one example of a movement that's clearly attempting to be intellectually rigorous is like effective altruism. Right, because they've defined yeah, their yeah, sort yeah, of yeah, goals yeah. as we are going to use the best social science and philosophy we can find to figure out how we can do the most good. So that's a thing where mm. that sets up a set of norms in favor of scientific inquiry and in favor of drawing from yeah, a yeah, wide yeah. range of sources and trying to like do credence calibration and all this sort of stuff. Um, uh, so, so that's an example. So that's an example where clearly there can be attempts to build social movements that are going to be more rigorous. Um, and I guess the question is, can some of these movements that are now, now the potential downside of that is maybe movements like that, like rationalist spaces seem like they have maybe more people who are going to, I, I don't know if this is true, but they, they might, because they're trying not to have taboos on raising certain types of inquiry, maybe they're going to have more people who might like say transphobic or sexist shit than a like social anarchist space would. And so there's a downside there because it's it's seen potentially as a loss of rigor to just like say before engaging in a like mm. civil argument hey that argument is like out of court that's offensive that's oppressive that's shitty um and so mm. because of that trade-off between like having a mm. default assumption that everyone in a space is committed to a particular type of liberatory politics and having mm. openness for a wide range of intellectual influences and discussions it might be the case that mm. um how we negotiate that that uh we we can move th there might be a lot of movements that sort of aren't on the like production possibilities frontier and can mm. improve along both margins um and i think that's true yep. right like, yes yes i, I think i think most yeah, movements yeah. are not like all are not like maximally good in terms of inclusion of marginalized groups or epistemic rigor so we should try and make moves that mm. are good along both margins before saying let's trade off one for the other um mm. uh but 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 yeah so moving towards norms that are better for both of those seems like a good idea and it seems like we can do that and model mm. that within our own spaces um the fact that we can easily yeah. just like start up various prefigurative projects whether that's podcasts or mm. community yeah. centers or whatever else means that it's not as though we're stuck with some particular existing movement. People can try out creating new kinds yeah, of spaces. Yeah, yeah. So I think there's room for that sort of yeah. stuff. And maybe uh, one thing that could be usefully done would be trying to set up more uh, research oriented, like more mm. things for links between research and activism. And there are groups that try and do that. Mm. But I think those, the existing ones might be prone to a certain type of partisanship that, might prevent some of the yep. types of conversations we're talking about having. And so starting some new ones aimed at that yeah, would be interesting. Yeah. Like maybe a more academic version of something like C4SS could be useful for that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's um, I think, I think also just like, uh, like a sort of like a big thing that we haven't really talked about, but you know, is obviously influential here is like, I think that, the internet but also like the it its accessibility over like the last decade uh has like really changed things and i think like a lot of you know just because like it's difficult to update models when something so like big that affects everything happens uh that like there's just like a lot of areas where like you know there's probably low-hanging fruit uh especially with regards to like epistemic um dynamics that like you know we just like we like haven't really like people just haven't like really like figured out just because like you know so much fucking shit has happened over the last decade that, oh yeah like, i can forgive people for not 
I can forgive people for like not trying to like you know figure these things out. Um, like like I mean like what one of the reasons uh, that I am confident in like anarchist um, ideas uh, disrupting Marxism is um, it, it it's like uh, Marxism like you know as David Graeber put it is like really well suited to the academy mm-hmm. um, and like. I, 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 I'm not, you know, I, I, I don't think that like academia is going to just like disappear overnight, but I think, uh, I think in terms of knowledge production, um, you know, I think that it, it has like lost its monopoly thanks to the internet mm-hmm. for good or ill. Um, and I think that that means that, you know, like, uh, th- there's like a, there's like a, there's like an opening there. Whereas like, you know, before, um, like having to, you know, contort anarchism to like fit the, uh, like fit into academia would have like, you know, made it lose like a lot of, you know, what's valuable about it. Um, and also, and in doing so, like, you know, made it like less distinct from Marxism. I think like now that, you know, like the, the, like, the the way that you can do like sort of knowledge production is just like so much bigger um i think that means that you know there's just a like like i i I think just like part of it is also just like uh to be very sort of vulgar about it uh like anarchists i feel are just more uh entrepreneurial about getting our ideas out there yeah Um, you know i like there's like there's like trotsky's parties who are still like selling fucking newspapers in like <laughs> 2021 <laughs> um you know I, I i know that um i know that like you know uh we haven't done the best because especially because of like shit like primitivism uh and like there's still a lingering tech 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 phobia but like you know go to like the anarchist library and then go to like marxism.org and the anarchist library is just so much easy to use and like just looks so much better. Yeah. Um, and like, I, yeah, I, I, I think, I think, I, I, I think that like, you know, especially, especially if like, uh, there's just like a whole bunch of people, um, who are like, you know, really trying to like formalize, um, you know, conjectures, uh, made by like anarchists like historical anarchists into like more like formal you know models that like you know you can then like turn into like pretty graphics and like make a really slick like youtube video or like you know uh like interactive essay or something um whereas like that's that's like quite difficult to do with marxism as it currently exists and so i i think i think stuff like that just means that you know um in terms of like presentation um which unfortunately matters um i think i think like we will have an edge that will continue to compound so yeah that that's that's one reason why i'm optimistic yeah i definitely share a lot of that optimism i mean as you were saying the anarchist library has just such a broad range of texts and it's very easy to upload and download mm-hmm. texts they have it downloadable in zine yeah. form in a lot of different formats and so like mm. my partner has actually um, developed sort of a hobby because their friend is really into one of their friends is really into bookbinding. They've gotten into just like downloading mm. various texts from the anarchist library, just making their own zines of various sorts and uh, just making a lot of different mm. ones with a lot of different types of papers. So, so it winds up being a pretty straightforward thing that you can do from with all of these different anarchist texts. And there's so many more each day that you yeah. can find and learn from. And so I think that's really promising. And I think you're right that there's also all of these people who are moving into, um, the, uh, into trying to formalize these using different tools, which I think fits in with the point that we were making about how there's, uh, more of a Mm. desire to use different social scientific tools. And I don't want to say no one's done that with Marxism, right? There's like also the, there's like the analytic Marxists and stuff who try to do that, but it's still very promising that people are trying out new analytical and representational tools for um, teasing out the implications of these conjectures in older anarchist theory. And I think that that has a lot of promise. Mm. 
And I, I definitely remember, I recently read part of Fragments of an Anarchist Anthropology where Graeber makes this point about how yeah. Marxism is really well suited to the academy because you build up this like research program around a specific set of dead authors. Um, whereas, yeah. Um, yeah, the the anarchist approach doesn't necessarily lend itself to any particular discipline or to any particular mm. pre-existing research program, but I think it motivates a whole uh, scope of research mm. programs. And as I've been sort of starting in my academic career, I've been thinking about this in terms of like, you know, people in my professional position are sort of supposed to be in some sense, like objective mm. scholars. And I'm not an objective person. I have, like, I have a set of normative views that I've been expressing throughout this conversation and that yeah. you can find me expressing yes. over the years, many places. But I think what that provides in terms of like having a sort of so-called positive value free research program is it provides a set of questions, right? So, um, mm. Somebody who's not hostile to states is not necessarily going to bother to ask the question of like, well, is it possible to provide defense without the state? They're just potentially going to sort of yeah. like read a standard econ textbook treatment of it and say, oh, there's a public good problem. Therefore, we should have the state do it. And that'll, that'll be the end of it. Whereas if you're somebody who like burns with anger at what actually existing state militaries do, which I do, <laughs> then that's going to motivate you to ask the question of like, what do alternatives to this potentially look like? Um, how would we deal with the incentive problems associated with collective action problems? Uh, what mm. are the incentives and dynamics of actually existing state run militaries and so on? And like, that's a huge portion of my research program. And obviously that introduces some set of biases that might shape the conclusions, which is why my work should still be subjected to peer review. People should respond to it. And so, and write, papers critiquing yeah, yeah. me where they think I'm wrong and so on. But I think that there's a bunch of questions that are research questions that people who don't share my value judgments would find interesting that are motivated by my anarchist value judgments. So I think, I think there's a lot of potential there as well of just asking what questions does this provoke? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And of course, you know, like there's the obvious like point that like you can't really have value free science um yeah there's, there's no view from nowhere <laughs> yeah yeah and, and like like also you know just like you know you like have to be motivated to seek out truth otherwise i don't know like your results would just be like randomly generated numbers or something yeah exactly um, right like if you're gonna finish a dissertation or like get papers published it helps to be researching yes. topics you think are interesting and important like obviously there are some people who are just sort of like studying math for the beauty of math or something and i think there are some economists who are yeah. doing that too of just like i'm going to tease out this new model or whatever and see what it implies and then maybe i'll talk to an applied person who can show me what in an actually existing economy this might be relevant to um but in general, I think it's useful to have a motivation of something that really drives you. And so I think anarchism for me is mm. a big part of that. And I think that that can drive a really interesting social scientific research program. Yep. Yep. Um, whew, okay. Well, this is, um, I think, I think I say, I think I say this like every guest, but like, I think this has actually been uh, the best podcast that I've done. So oh, wow. congrats. Thanks thank you um, well thank you for having me yeah, i've really enjoyed it yeah we like really really fleshed some stuff out um i'm yeah. one of one of the things that i want to write eventually is um uh like a critique of not just like marxist praxis but also like marxist uh theory that mm -hmm. like uh centers collective action problems because i think um I think that he like Marx's uh like his like fundamental stuff around like the labor theory of value, I think that I think it like has direct ties to no, not direct ties. It has assumptions about uh collective action that like uh I think I think like you know, look looking at the world, but also like public choice like really contests. Uh and I think uh i i think that's like really important um and so yeah um that, like, i would love one to reason i wanted to have you on yeah well it's like kind of a mess right now but yes all uh, right well i i want to put it together awesome um, i'd be really excited but yeah well, like one of the reasons i wanted to have you on is you know 
just to, like talk about like ideas in this sort of space um because uh you know it it's uh it's good for me to you know my intellectual output to not just be like you know me writing stuff down on a page or like thinking stuff because um you know it like you can like miss stuff and you know, you're like you're you're yeah, an academic, right? that. You know, you know these sort of things. Yeah, Con- yeah. conversations with I, I, co-authors I, I, and colleagues and friends and so on have definitely yeah, yeah. helped save me from making various mistakes in papers, or have helped me stay motivated to finish projects. All yeah. these sorts of things, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. given me ideas for yeah. new ones. It's like socialization is key to the research and writing process for sure. Like, it's it's not some solitary activity in a study. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, all right. Well, I think, um, I think like, uh, yeah, uh, we'll end it around here. Um, I'm probably gonna, have, gonna, I'm gonna have to do uh, like a bit of editing because mm-hmm. of various things, but whatever, uh, it's still like really good. Uh, so like, do you want to, you know, point people in the direction of things that they need to be pointed in the direction of? Sure. Um, I suppose if you wanted to find out more about my work, you can follow me on Twitter at Nathan P. Goodman, and mm. you can find my website, uh, www.nathanpgoodman.com. Um, I also have a Google Scholar profile that we could link in the show notes mm. and an SSRN profile if you wanted to read my work. And if you wanted to read about sort of the main text that has uh, been sort of providing the motivating framework throughout this, today's conversation. Uh, you should look up Randall Holcomb's book, Political Capitalism, mm. uh, How Economic and Political Power is Made and Maintained, which is available from Cambridge University Press. It's a little bit pricey, so if you can't find it on LibGen or anything like that, you could also look at his paper in the Cato Journal that is also titled Political Capitalism, which mm. deals with a lot of these uh, same issues. And he also has a couple of recent papers or relatively recent papers in the independent review that deal with a lot of these same issues. And in particular, um, let's look at his um, uh, independent review articles. Um, He has a paper from fall 2018 called the coast theorem applied to markets and government Mm. that goes into a lot of the details Mm -hmm. of the role of transaction costs in helping us understand these political processes and the class relations that arrive that arise out of them. So like the abstract ends with the sentence first published in 1960 to shed light on markets and property rights. Professor Ronald Coase's famous insight also helps explain how political elites can impose costs on others and thus provides an economic foundation for a theory Mm -hmm. that social scientists developed more than a century ago. So that's like, that's another paper that has the core insights of the book. And I remember when I first read his Cato journal article, because Chris Coyne sent it to me as we were working on a project together, Hmm. it was like, mind blowing and i was like oh this this is the framework applying coasts to do class analysis this this is it and then i saw him later that year speak on it at appy it was great so definitely read holcomb's stuff all right uh well i guess i have to call this uh cosian class conflict with cool cat nathan goodman shame (laughs) you don't have seen your name (laughs) We're getting a lot of getting a lot of alliteration in. <laughs>